figure out where the gaps are and how we can move forward together to really make progress on having a lot more renewable energy in Broward County. So today's agenda is packed, as usual. Um, we have the introduction, which will be short, and then we're going to have a panel on community initiatives. Then we're going to have a panel on public sector investments. Then we'll have a short break uh, where everybody will write down uh, some of the solutions that you've heard or that you know about to some of the challenges that you posted today. We're going to start documenting those. Then we'll have a third panel on market forces and technical innovations. Then we're going to do a really cool interactive mapping exercise about um, some potential resiliency hubs that we could have in our community. We'll have a great next steps discussion summarizing uh, what solutions we still need in our community, where we can go, and we'll adjourn it for. So we're going to crank it up, crank up the heat, turn on the sun, get this thing going. Uh, thank you all so much for being here, and let, let's roll. First up is uh, Dr. Samantha Danchuk. Okay, so before I start to you know uh, boggle your brain with our with our units back and forth, I just wanted to say it one time at least. Um, so. Uh, mo for most of the time we're talking about solar, we'll be talking about kilowatt installations. Just want you to acknowledge that there's a thousand kilowatts in a, uh, in a megawatt, and then there's a thousand megawatts in a gigawatt. Okay, so I'm going to use those units a couple different ways as I'm talking through this. Um, just for quick reference, so a kilowatt installation would ultimately power maybe 76 light bulbs for a year. A megawatt installation could maybe power 10 retail stores. A gigawatt installation could maybe power 170,000 homes. Um, so when you think about 1.8 million people in the county um, and all the property that we have and how much power we need to generate, we're really talking on the order of gigawatts, right? But when we talk about residential home installations, we're talking about kilowatt installations on your roof or side yard, right? Okay, next. Okay, so where are we at today? So we successfully did our first demonstration project at Young at Art. Um, hopefully you've all visited and seen the uh, solar canopy that's installed and they've done a lot of educational programming for that. So that was about 50 kilowatts. Um, we are putting forth a five-year program uh, requesting funds for solar investments, both for emergency energy resilience as well as um, investments at our county facilities. Uh, probably will lead to on the order of one megawatt of installation. Um, I asked FPL for the latest uh, in there, um, how many installations we have across Broward. Um, so they let me know that we have 568 uh, net metering customers in Broward out of 940,000 accounts. Okay, so you can see if you're drop in the bucket, but hopefully we'll see that uh, number grow and grow. And that totals about 8.2 megawatts, which is no small amount. Um, and then overall, FPL has said that they are continuing to invest in solar. They have about 335 megawatts uh, of, of power either installed or in planning uh, to be installed in the near future. Um, and then over, over the next five, well, when I had asked them for this, over the next few years, by 2020, they intend to replace uh, the same percentage of what coal and fuel oil that they're using with solar. So that's about 5% of their fuel mix. Um, I'll take questions at the end if that's okay, if you just make a note. Of course. Yes, everything, the summary and all the slides are shared on the website at the end. All right, okay, guys. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, that is excellent, but that's only 5%. So the reason I kind of shared this is to kind of bring up the, the conversation of scales, right? So, you know, we, yes, the utility needs to make these investments, but they are, um, you know, it's not going to get us to the point of that 100% that a lot of cities are making that commitment to. Um, so we need to really kind of think about what we can do at, at our regional scale and then what can individuals do. And you can see there's a long way to go. Oh, next. Oh, I touched it. I'm sorry, Jason. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, as a region, as a county, we have set the goal and it's listed in our climate action plan, it's listed in our um, energy strategic plan, it's listed in our, um, in our renewable energy action plan that we want to source about 20% of our energy from renewables. And that's about three gigawatts. So remember, that's the big one, 1,000 megawatts, right? So we have a very lofty goal for us to get to that point, right? Um, but we can do it, right? We have to. Jason? <laughs> we need a bigger, better signal. Next slide. <laughs> Stay on this slide. 
Okay, so, uh, you know, the first conversation in solar tends to start with rooftops. We know that that is not the end-all be-all answer, but I just wanted to start there because we had recently done some analysis in GIS just to answer some basic questions for ourselves. If we looked at all the rooftops in Broward, we could generate about nine gigawatts. So I told you to get to our 20% goal, we needed at least three. So that means we could meet that goal if we really started to use just rooftops. Um, so then I was curious, should we focus on large commercial installations? Should we focus on homeowners? You know, who, who has the most potential? And so looking at small buildings, so something less than 5,000 square feet, you know, or maybe residential and those small businesses, et cetera, that capacity is about five gigawatts. Then looking at medium buildings, so between five and 10,000 square feet, that's about two gigawatts. And then looking at large buildings in Broward, that's another two gigawatts. So, you know, I thought this was interesting because yes, we can meet our goal by focusing on the commercial properties, but it's also good to know that there's a lot of capacity at the residential level. And so promoting those programs in order to encourage people to participate in things like the solar co-op and a lot of the uh, opportunities that you're gonna hear about in the first panel um, makes a lot of sense as well. So if we used all of this rooftop capacity, it would still only offset about 63% of the energy that we're using. So it doesn't get us to 100%. I think that's important to note. Also, there may be reasons that you don't want to put solar on your roof. Because structural reasons, are, there's lot, that comes up a lot when we first start these planning efforts. So we're also looking at ground mounted, right? So those solar canopies shade your parking lots. That's a great feature. Maybe it's a walkway. Um, all those kinds of things add up to, uh, to, to be beneficial as well. Um, so we absolutely are pursuing ground mounted solar. In fact, at the county, that may be our preference in the near future. We also looked at, all right, say you just have to be responsible for what you're responsible for. So we looked at our county facilities. If we just use the rooftops for our county facilities, we could only offset about a third of the power that we are using for our operations. So again, just trying to get you to acknowledge that this is only gonna get done or get to that, you know, get to our goals if we work together. Because I can only offset, even if I used all my rooftops at the county facilities, I can only offset about a third of my power. So I'm going to have to think bigger than that. Next slide, please. Jason. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> OK, so I want us to think bigger, right? Because the point of all this is not just because I love the sun. I am a Floridian. You know, I want to see us use this you know, incredible renewable source of energy. It's that we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions so that we do not exceed temperatures uh, at a global scale that will increase the amount of sea level rise. We are about to spend lots and lots of money to adapt to sea level rise. We're planning for two feet by 2060. How much more do we want to invest in beyond that point? It's not gonna stop at 2060, it's gonna go beyond that. And that's why it's so important for us to invest in renewables and really concentrate on trying to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So again, from this analysis that I, was, uh, I had mentioned earlier, uh, this is actually also contained in our greenhouse gas emissions report um, and inventory. We looked at some reduction strategies to see what effect they would have. So if we assumed that all households install, or if 25% of households install um, solar panels and solar thermal systems, so heating your water uh, with solar by 2040, we could reduce or offset, or we could reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 22% from the residential energy use. If we assume that 100% of households participate, it's, it reduces it by 85%. And so that was aligned with what the goals we're trying to reach by 2040 is, right? We want to offset 85% um, of our emissions by 2040, 2050, right? So that helps us get towards our goal. Then looking at commercial benchmarking, so tracking the energy that you use and uh, installing and constructing retrofits so that you can actually reduce the amount of energy that you're using in commercial buildings. Um, if we did that across 1 million square feet of buildings, it could reduce greenhouse gases by 8% from uh, commercial electricity. If we did it on all commercial buildings, it, gets, it helps us reduce by 61%. And the point is here that 
whether or not the federal government puts in place policies that require certain uh, reduction strategies, um, there's going to be a huge piece that the local component will need to come up with, right? So there's going to be a gap that we need to fill. And so what we were trying to do was look at how much could we actually address. It's really important for the federal component to be in line, but we also need to make sure that we can do the most that we can. And then looking at both, you know, moderate goals, and that's why we looked at maybe the 25 percent or a certain amount of square feet. But then what if we went all the way and seeing what the possibilities are? Because it's very difficult when you're setting these arbitrary goals of 10 percent, 20 percent, et cetera. We need to actually see what's possible and what will work. So I think the point takeaway from here is uh, we can effectively reduce a significant, significant amount of the 25 million tons of greenhouse gases that we're producing every year as a county by using renewables and making sure that we're tracking and reducing our energy use. Next slide. So we also just uh, as an example went through and did kind of what would it take to get to the 100% renewable energy, right? And so we picked an example city. I won't let you know what it is, but you know, if you wanted to see the data, we can go through it together and just said what would be feasible, right? So the first step we said, all right, go ahead and convert to electric vehicles because half of our emissions are coming from transportation. Um, and then make sure that those electric vehicle sta charging stations are solar powered, right? Um, so if we transition 3% of those electric vehicles per year, that would be our first step. Then we try to convert the community to solar, assuming that we can install about 2,500, uh, you know, on average five kilowatt solar PV systems annually, um, both at the residential, commercial, uh, and commercial level. And then make sure that we're installing those solar EV uh, stations. And then uh, the third step would be, as you're going through this process, trying to purchase renewable energy credits um, until you get to the point where you're fully 100% renewable. So that, you know, by, I think we were aiming for, um, by 2050, this community could be 100% renewable. And so what the point of this was was that we had defined that path. It wasn't unreasonable to ask for, you know, 3% um, investments, et cetera, and 2,500 uh, installation systems. Um, and so it was kind of a unique, helpful exercise. And so I just want to let you know that we're thinking along this path, um, and we look forward to working with you um, for any of you that have committed to the 100% renewable energy goal. Next slide, please. So my last slide is just acknowledging that we really would like to see everyone in this room help us start to, um, whether it's at your city permitting level or um, depending on what other organization you represent, we need to standardize our tracking end of solar. Um, it's very difficult at this moment to get data from our utility uh, as far as location, the number, the wattage, et cetera. Um, and so we can build that into our own permitting process and be able to track that uh, at a more refined level. Um, we do want to support the voluntary solar program. FPL has been very explicit that they will make more investments in our community if more people are participating and there's more funds to spend on those demonstration projects um, and in the parks and at schools, et cetera, where they've been putting the solar canopies. Um, we also need to talk about different financing mechanisms so that everyone at different scales is able to make these investments. Um, that will come up in your, your first panel today. Uh, we, as part of the capital budget program uh, request that I had mentioned at the beginning, will be working with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory um, to have them kind of help us with some technical assistance to start to plan these projects, start to talk about conversations like microgrids, which you're going to hear about in your, in your third panel, um, and then also how do we incentivize the progression of this whole campaign, right? Um, and overall, really just trying to make sure that we're making the investments to get us to that 20% renewable energy goal, which we know is really critical to make us on our way to reduce greenhouse gases and ensure that we're not having to plan for more sea level rise than we want to. Okay, thank you. <laughs>